<clears throat> hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. It is our last meeting. And if you're like me, you have mixed feelings about that. Obviously, it's satisfying to finish another semester and get one under your belt, so to speak. But it's also, you know, kind of disappointing to have to wind it up and to have to say goodbye to the topics in the class. Many of you know that political economy and development are my main interests. So in addition to teaching this stuff, I also write articles of my own and, and publish and do research. And I really contribute in ways that I take quite seriously. And so it's always a sad state to, to say goodbye and, and move on. But even so, I had such a wonderful semester with you, and I think that we had a really excellent experience in here, and we did a lot of different things. We learned a lot. We saw a perspective and a, a set of lenses that maybe were, were less well understood when we started, and now we have a way of looking at the world that is much more sophisticated than maybe we had before, at the very least. Political economy is a very useful interdisciplinary gateway, so to speak, to thinking about problems in a much more flexible way. And in my experience, you know, within the academy and outside of the academy, increasingly, there's a great value placed on that flexibility and that interdisciplinary agility. If you can sort of straddle a variety of boundaries and if you can work across traditional borders it's hugely valuable because really let's face it in a global economy borders dissolve and so it's important to be educated and to think about problems in a way that is equally borderless so to speak so that's just sort of my um i guess soapbox comment before we get started I had a great semester with you and I really enjoyed it and your enthusiasm. Before we do get started today, uh, I thought that I would give you a chance to ask any questions about the review guide that I posted and shared with you on Wednesday. As a reminder, the exam is tomorrow morning, which is just shockingly soon. It's like the first exam period of the final exam period of like a full week. So it's coming, but we have a chance to, to spend a moment here discussing or addressing any questions that you have. Presumably you've been studying and thinking about the exam. And as a reminder, it's not cumulative. And the topics that we've covered since the midterm are fair game. But the review guide that I shared with you on Wednesday is, is fairly thorough. And I suggest that as before, if you if you prepare and you're, you're ready to go into the exam and, and write about and address those different issues, and if you've reviewed and if you've read those readings in the first place, you'll be in a good position to, uh, to do well on the exam. Um, of course, I know that when it gets down to it, exams can be stressful, and, but I'm confident that if, if you prepare and if you use me as a resource as well as your TA, you, know, you can be in a position to do well. So what questions do you have? What should we address about the exam before we get back to uh, the good stuff? I see a comment in the chat, which I'll get to here in a moment. I'm switching rooms because my neighbors are a little bit loud today. Lewis says, is the exam really set to take three hours long or will it be way less time consuming if we did good on the review guide? Yeah, so as I said on um, Wednesday, no, it, it won't be a three hour long exam in terms of the content and the substance. It will be longer than the midterm just because it is a larger time period. And that does mean that you should be ready to do a little bit more work, but it won't be three times as long uh, by any stretch. It'll be moderately longer. It'll be reasonable. I don't intend to burden you. I think a lot about the length of the exam 
and I, I want to make sure that you have the time, but no, you don't need to spend three hours on it. Now, that being said, if you do, that's fine. Some students take three hours and that's completely acceptable. Um, I was a student who took all the time I had when I was an undergraduate. Even if the exam was relatively short, I would still use all of the available time, but that was me. You don't have to do the same. Any other comments or questions about the exam, the study guide? As a reminder, I did share the study guide in the chat on Wednesday, but I also posted it on CAD courses. So if you are a student who, don't, who does not have that, I would snag that from CAD courses right now. Does anyone here not have it? Should I share it in the chat? If anyone needs it, I'm happy to share it. Yeah, why not? I'll just share it. I'm sure there might be someone here who could who could use it. Oh, wait, hold on. I sent that to Lewis. Sorry. <laughs> Senior moment. <laughs> My bad. Here we go. All right. There you go, everyone. If you hadn't grabbed the review guide, there it is. I'll give you just another moment or two. And if there are no comments or questions. So Lewis says, will the exam be in CAT courses or would we need to upload a file to submit it? As before, the exam will be a file on CAT courses, but there will be an assignment link as well on CAT courses where you go to submit it when you're done. So you, you just obtain the exam from the files, it'll be posted probably with a few minutes to spare before the exam period starts because I always post it a little bit early, but it'll be posted. And then you have the duration of the three hours to complete it. If you finish it earlier, no problem. If you take the full three hours, no problem. But you go ahead and submit it to the assignment tab when you're done as before and we'll be good. Christiana, do you have a question? Yeah, um, have you, um, like, is there, or do you know how many questions is going to be on it yet? You, so I'll just tell you um, that the multiple choice questions will be somewhere between 25 and 35. And the short answer questions will be, hold on. Let me take a look at the. Just a moment. And in terms of short answers, you'll have somewhere between probably uh, four and five. So you'll have more multiple choice, but not that many more and you'll have more short answer, but it won't be even twice as many. And so you just need to be prepared to write a little bit more and answer a few more questions. But as a reminder, everything is fair game. And what Adolfo and I noticed on the midterm is that students could improve the most on the multiple choice. And this is mainly in the area of the multiple choice questions pertaining to the reading. Now that reading is reading that is assigned and that you need to complete and that has been assigned from the beginning. And so I, I always make sure that those questions are very general and that those questions should be reasonable if you've completed the reading. And so I, I think that if you are better prepared with the readings, you can really improve your performance on the multiple choice. The short answer responses, your responses 
in those areas were, were, were quite good. I think that the most improvement can be made in the area of the multiple choice and in particular pertaining to the reading. And what you need to do is you need to review those readings. And, and again, when you review those readings, I'm not gonna ask you a question about a detail you know, on page 29 in the, in the third paragraph. The questions are about the big picture and about you know, the argument or the main idea of the, argue, of the piece or you know, some very big part of it that is discernible if you've completed the reading and if you've reviewed that reading and if you've completed the response essay as well. All of these assignments have been designed to get you thinking about the reading in a concrete way so that you're in a position to, to perform a little bit better on the multiple choice on the, on the final exam. Another question, Christiana? Yes. Um, and for the free response, are we allowed to take parts of the text as our answer, or would you rather it all be our own words? So my preference is that you would use your own words because there's a real value placed on just comprehension. And think about it like this. You really, above all, want to demonstrate your understanding and that you know the, the, the concept or the relationship or the, the issue that you're addressing. And so using a, a quote from the text might be helpful, but above all, you want to try to show us that you understand it in, in a way that is your own way and that is, is generally correct, right? So use it carefully is what I would say. Maybe not a big block of text, but if you have a, a phrase or a part of a sentence that helps you to make a point, absolutely. But what I would generally say is don't, don't put the cart before the horse. Always really use text or use ideas from the text to support your arguments, not the other way around. Don't use your arguments to support the text. You really want to be instrumental about how you, you use the, the material. What I'm most concerned about is you, well, performing as best as you can on the multiple choice in especially the areas related to the reading. That's the area where students can improve the most. And so with regard to the text and the reading, I'm convinced that, that students review the reading and are prepared to, to use that reading. But I would encourage you to try to think about that reading in a more general way. And at the beginning of the semester, you'll remember that I su suggested maybe keeping a reading log where you, for every reading, address the same set of questions. You know, what is the research question? What is the hypothesis or the argument? You know, what is the evidence or the, the, the empirical information provided? And, and what are some of the implications? Just sort of these general questions that are really independent of the way the article is written or the way the material is, prevent, is presented and that relate really more to your understanding and how you can package it in a way that you can use it later. So when I create those questions for the multiple choice, I work from my own sort of understanding of the reading and really the big picture, right? The, the main argument, the sort of hypothesis and the, the theoretical content, the big picture, the stuff that is, is, is on a map, so to speak, when you look at the big, big picture. And so I'm confident that you can do it. I know too that the midterm was the first, really the first exam that we had in the class. And so as a result, there's always some learning that takes place in the, that residual learning takes place over the course of the next several weeks after the midterm. And so students always do better on the final than they do in the midterm. And I thought frankly that you did reasonably well on the midterm. It's just that the, the multiple choice in the area of the reading is the area for the most improvement. Uh, any other comments or questions about the study guide or the exam or your preparation?
you know, I won't belabor the point and you don't need to take my advice, but there are a lot of useful strategies and ways to organize and keep track of notes that you take or reading responses or information that you take to try to, to clarify the reading. Sometimes in addition to keeping a reading log that answers those questions that I listed, it can be useful to try to synthesize them and, and relate them to each other. So with each subsequent week, maybe you you add a couple sentences to like a like a journal entry that you keep yourself where you literally just try to relate each reading to the last week's reading. That's actually a, a simple but intuitive way for you to build an understanding of your own that can be very, very useful when you start to write papers and do work in the class. And you know, it's the end of the semester and, and maybe this is the kind of thing that was better shared with you at the start. Um, and, and for that, I apologize, but I did suggest the idea of the reading log, maybe going forward, that's just a set of strategies that works well together. The reading log plus the, the synthetic kind of journaling that, that students, you know, aren't required often to do, but can really benefit from doing. And with that, I think we can begin to transition and think about the last of the substance that I have for you. And really the place that I thought would be a neat place to, to end is, is by highlighting the relationship between political and economic reform. So we've been discussing reform and the political economy of reform, policy change. And we've talked about how reform can take neoliberal market-oriented forms and it can take more heterodox statist interventionist forms where the state's institutions are strengthened and where there are a number of, of initiatives that are intended to strengthen or enhance the role of the state, even through the formation or creation of new state enterprises in strategic areas. Reforms can take a number of different forms and we've got to think about reform as multidimensional and, and nuanced and really likely to take a particular form based on the characteristics of the country and the unique history and politics and economy of the place. Well, there's a particular, there's a, an important role, excuse me, I can't talk today. There's an important relationship between political and economic reforms. And so far, everything that we've talked about implies both economic as well as political changes. Because remember that neoliberal market-oriented changes usually involve privatization or changes in state spending priorities, market allocation of credit, market allocation in determination of, of exchange rates, on and on and on. These are neoliberal economic reforms. We can think of political reforms as well though, that are important in creating a foundation to support those economic changes. So I talked to you on Wednesday about strengthening economic institutions like the treasury or other economic decision-making bureaucracies involved in spending or budgets or planning, state institutions that are involved in dispersing credit, state institutions that are involved in ensuring accountability or routing out corruption, ensuring transparency in the allocation of public resources so that investments can be maximized in, in their full potential, so that long-term strategies can be outlined and pursued without interruption resulting from political or economic change. And most importantly, political changes and state strengthening so that the state's property rights are protected when you go and privatize those firms. Because we know from the examples of Argentina and Russia and many other countries that if you don't strengthen the state first, the economic reforms will not produce the efficiency gains that are promised. 
Because, for example, think about it. If you don't strengthen the state, and if the state's not strong enough to prevent monopolies from sucking up all of the privatized companies, you'll just wind up with very uncompetitive private sectors. And that's what the, that's the situation in Russia. That was the case to a certain degree in sectors like steel and petrochemicals in Argentina in the 90s. There are many examples of countries where insufficient state strengthening or insufficient state reforms and political changes resulted in economic reforms that performed very, very poorly and that did not produce efficiency gains and did not produce the income gains and the, the overall benefits that they could have produced if they had strengthened the state and strengthened political institutions first. So these political reforms involve a lot of changes that we've been talking about kind of implicitly and discussing all semester long. The strengthening of accountability institutions, the strengthening of property rights, well, that's economic, but the strengthening of rule of law, the strengthening of an independent judiciary, courts that have the capacity to support and protect property rights, that's so critical. Property rights don't mean anything if you don't have a state that has the capacity to protect them. And we mean chiefly courts, a judiciary, but also police powers and military powers of the state that have the capacity to protect property rights. So this involves a series of political changes that are essential to supporting those economic transformations and that must take place if those economic transformations are going to pro produce the economic gains that they are supposed to be able to produce. And so the, here's the big picture. And this is a lesson that I've taught you from day one. Politics and economics goes hand in hand. They go hand in hand. To hell in a handbag, as, as we sometimes say. But in the same sense, political and economic reforms go hand in hand. They dovetail, they go together. Political changes support economic changes. Economic changes feed back into political changes because when you liberalize political institutions and when you create and strengthen democratic institutions and you strengthen accountability institutions and when you disperse power and strengthen an independent judiciary, you help to create conditions that strengthen and support economic actors who then develop an incentive in further and deeper democratic political reforms that will then further support and further reinforce their property rights and further protect their economic position rooted as it is in a free market, a free society. So as always, there's a relationship between politics and economics and political and economic reforms exhibit the same kind of relationship. And the way that I thought we could look at this is by considering two Eastern European countries who have a very, very different trajectory with regard to both political and economic changes. And before I do that, let me pause and take a look at the chat because I missed a comment here. No, Rady, I'm just giving you short uh, responses. I'm giving you a, a larger um, number of short responses instead of a long essay. But it is still written, partly. It's just that there is no long essay. Thank you, Rady. So let's look at two Eastern European countries who have a very, very different experience in terms of their political and economic reforms. On the one hand, we have the country of Belarus, which is 
Europe's last dictatorship. It's a it's a it's a dictatorship, right? Where democratic institutions are weakened and, and don't fully function, and where power is mainly concentrated in the executive. And in Belarus, in the 1990s, they pursued very, very, very shallow economic reform. I told you and showed you on Wednesday that they only pursued minimal sectoral reform in some natural resources like oil and gas. The rest of the economy was left alone. And so it still has that statist, socialist, sort of centralized, non-competitive character. But even more minimal were the political reforms. As I said, Belarus is Europe's last dictatorship and there's been no, there's been virtually no political liberalization. And so we can look at this in the following way. First, we can look at polity two, which is a measure of political reform and political liberalization. It, basi it basically assesses the, the strength and the condition of, of a number of democratic institutions. And it ranges from negative seven, which is dictatorship, full dictatorship, to, to seven, which is democracy. And, or excuse me, it actually, so this, this is placed on a scale of from one to zero. And in, in, so this is, altering the scale. But for our purposes, polity is a measure of political reform. EBRD is a measure of economic reform in terms of competitiveness, governance, transparency, and other dimensions that go along with development as we've really discussed it. And you'll notice that in Belarus, lo and behold, there's been virtually no political reform and there's been virtually no economic reform. There's been a little bit more economic reform. As I mentioned, oil and gas, some liberalization in the 90s and 2000s. But the, the general trajectory, the general relationship is, is very tight and exhibits a, a close link between political and economic change. And it shows that where there is limited political change, there is limited economic change. And that's then quite compelling because it does suggest that political and, e and economic reform are interrelated and in that to get economic reform, you must first have political reform. Now, take a look at the case of Poland. Poland is a very different example. Poland is a very deep reformer, very aggressive, progressive reformer, intense, prolonged political democratic reforms, accession to the European Union, you name it, all of the different, all of the different democratic mechanisms and anchors are there. And throughout the 80s and 90s, Poland very aggressively shifted from, from a authoritarian regime to a, a democratic one. Of course, it's important to note that they were more democratic from the beginning in some sense compared to, to other countries, but they also went much further, even so. But look again at the relationship between polity and EBRD, our measure of economic reform. And you'll notice that very, very closely, economic reform tracks political reform. And again, it appears as though political reform precedes economic reform, and that more generally, the trend begins in politics and flows to economics. Now, some may say economic reform drives political reform, but that would be well, that would be silly, considering that they started in a statist, centralized socialist economy that was a deeply political economy in the sense that political change would have to come before many of the changes in the economy that themselves were, were legal and that had been created as part of the, the state model. So in other words, how do you privatize a state company uh, unless you pursue political reforms that help to, to create the mechanisms for, for privatizing companies? And so political and economic reforms go hand in hand. And the lesson is an important one because it, it's very consistent with what we've said from day one. And I wanted to stress to you that Political economy is a story about the intermarriage of these, these
these two forces. And time and time again, we see this. And in, in the final analysis, we see that political and economic development as a result of reform requires political and economic reform to come together. And, and when they come together, they produce important changes and important gains for those countries that, that pursue those changes. So what I wanna do now is actually show you a video um, about Belarus, Europe's last dictatorship. And this is a way for us to sort of put um, a final touch on things and put things in perspective. It's um, a way for us to just kind of relax a little bit here at the end and watch and see in detail what this situation of stalled political and economic change looks like. So Belarus is essentially stuck, so to speak, in authoritarian rule. And as a result, there's been very limited economic change too. So let's go ahead and, and watch this. Вот поэтому так получается, что за нами постоянно кто-то ходит. Вы даже не представляете объем, что здесь творится. I think I'm using the freedom I have and the availability of the digital processes, you know, for my people. People do everything behind closed doors. And you have to be careful about the intention of the next guys. Anything can happen. Todo lo que estamos logrando de informar a las personas, de hacer denuncias, de peor, está marcando historia, está marcando un manual de estilo para el mundo entero. Aquí hace un poco un bataje muy caliente. ¿Qué tal me queda? Acá haramana, acá edema. La tengo batalizada con ga, en mi de tubo con ga, no hago ruido gas, no le tengo nada. Это ни для кого не секрет, что они в Беларуси у политиков и журналистов прослушиваются. Вот поэтому так получается, что за нами постоянно кто-то ходит. Вы даже не представляете объем, что здесь творится. Тотальная слежка идет за любой журналистской деятельностью, особенно то, что касается больных мест, которые связаны в той или иной степени с коррупцией. According to Reporters Without Borders, freedom of press in Belarus is the lowest rated in Europe, even compared to neighboring Russia. Denis Deskovich is a journalist who runs a local online paper in the small town of Rogozhov. Vice News was there to find out if independent media was surviving amidst an intense government crackdown. Здравствуйте. Это я, Денис Дашкевич, руководитель регионального портала Рогачев Онлайн. Скажите, а вы живете в этих домах? А вот что-то центральный парк города никак не доделывают. Задумка была большая. 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 По официальным данным, на реконструкцию этого парка было выделено порядка 600 тысяч долларов США. Это не, ну здесь да. я вообще не вижу. Я даже тут тысячи долларов не вижу, честно говоря. Где привезли, разгрузили, где-то находится mm -hmm. на складе. Так опять же упирается все это самое у мамы. Да. Mm -hmm. Ману все упирается. А где они денежки возьмут? То есть те деньги проели? Проели, оно... да, пропили. Ну, конечно, часть пропили, часть проели, часть там перевели, обналичивали там. Ну, это ясное дело. А часто так вот машины сюда приезжают? Unannounced, a convoy of official cars arrive. Что вы такие? Я житель города. А я спрашиваю, кого кто снимает. Они меня снимают. Так а что, нельзя парк снимать? Так а вы представитель городской администрации?
ну, как выяснилось, непростых жителей. Но я так предполагаю, за нами уже так пристально следят здесь. Это обыденность, то есть ничего удивительного нет. Немного непонятные действия, вот они кому-то звонят там по телефону. По всей видимости, кое-кто очень не хочет, чтобы это стало известно более широкой публике, в том числе за рубежом, в странах Евросоюза. As we attempted to leave, Dennis is stopped again, this time by a woman who identified herself as Rogoshov's chief of ideology. Так, хорошо, все, работайте. До свидания. Спасибо, до свидания. On leaving, we were stopped once more. This time by road traffic police. Вы сами реально видите, просто цеплены все. Ну, это, это идет психологическое давление. Реально криминальная банда, правда. But Dennis is just one of many independent journalists facing a day-to-day -day struggle to report within the country sometimes called Europe's last dictatorship. Its first and only president, Alexander Lukashenko, has been in power for 22 years, winning five straight electoral rounds that international observers have judged as neither free nor fair. Despite constitutional provisions for freedom of the press, criticism of the president or the government is considered a criminal offence. Offending journalists have been beaten, blacklisted and jailed. However, a new generation of dissidents like Dennis are discovering ways to overcome the media blackout. Здравствуйте, вы к нам? Подождем еще кого-нибудь, хорошо? Victoria is part of an underground performance group called Belarus Free Theater, who often focus their plays on political issues unreported by state media. Да, вам сюда, мы подождем буквально две минуты и двинемся, все в порядке. They operate covertly due to the previous police raids and arrests of the performers and audience members. Whilst the rest of the audience gathered, we headed to the garage where the performance was being prepared. Алло, здравствуйте, это Свободный театр, мы его. Нет, к сожалению, на зону молчания места закончились, но мы будем играть ее на следующей неделе дважды. Это стороной, да? Сейчас мы перестанем, посмотрим, куда еще эту лампу новую прицепить. Make pressure on the audience. Some of them tell us that after our performances, they have a warning that next time, if you will uh, go to the to BFT, we will uh, fight you. When we were rehearsing, when we start this project, we were worried about our neighbors every heating or every sound out of the door i was so scared it's like i always thinking about something can happen with me with me but i hope that it will not <laughs> Someone who knows the repercussions of covering taboo topics in Belarus better than most is Nikolai, the group's director, who has an arrest warrant in Belarus and is currently exiled in London, where he writes, directs and manages performances using Skype. Спасибо, что вы пришли, и 
хорошего просмотра. Через неделю, ближе к Новому году, я вас переведу в камеру без унитазов, в которой вы сидели первую неделю. Вы не будете пить воду, чтобы не страдать так сильно, ну, как и не пили. А через месяц ваши придатки не дадут вам жить. А еще через месяц начнутся необратимые процессы, и вы больше никогда не сможете иметь детей. To create this performance, we met three of these women to talk with them and other political prisoners. So, absolutely, what happened with these three women, you can see on stage. Tonight went without interruption. Performers remain wary. I'm always could see KGB guys around just because my mind is broke a little bit. For example, when people are asking questions about how much do we pay for the rent, that's just an ordinary question, I know. So let's let's see. Although Belarus Free Theatre is able to raise issues behind closed doors, public dissent is even more challenging, as protesting is illegal in Belarus. We joined reporters from the online newspaper Nashaniva as they covered a local protest against the imprisonment of popular Ukrainian politician Nadia Shavchenko. Her detention has been condemned as illegal by the EU. Зараз, як ми бачимо, тут немає державних медіа, ну, за того, що їм просто не вигідно це робити. Окупанти, бої з Білорусі! Свободу! Надія Савченка! Журналісти працюють, тому, як правило, зараз все закінчується штрафом таким образом. То есть раньше это могли бы быть сутки, но сейчас в Беларуси в связи с тем, что нужны кредиты, МВФ и так далее. Слава Украине! Слава Украине! Убийца Путин! The Nasha Neva reporter's presence in the day may have been enough to prevent the police giving harsher sanctions, and 70,000 people were able to watch their report of the protest online. However, that still leaves most of the country in the dark and reliant on state media for their news. In order to understand the current media landscape, we wanted to speak to someone from State TV. We got in touch with Igor Krustalev, a talk show host and former vice president of one of Belarus's national TV channels. Журналистика как четвертая власть не существует. И я не питаю по этому поводу никаких иллюзий. Очень многие каналы осуществляют свои доходы за счет того, что получают рекламные доходы от ретрансляции больших российских телеканалов. Все, все вещатели в Беларуси – это в той или иной степени государственные телекомпании. Это просто традиции, которые остались от Советского Союза. Я думаю, что мы с вами разговариваем в тот момент, когда должен произойти какой-то определенный исторический надлом, потому что телевидение перестало иметь то влияние, которое имело раньше, и я думаю, вопросы этого финансирования будут пересматриваться. A news station that, despite being denied registration by the state, still broadcasts from neighboring Poland. Вироки пошли аж на 10 человек, а усе за подтримання осудженої у Росії українській льотчиці Надії Савченки. Anyone with a satellite or internet connection in Belarus can watch, with an audience of 400,000 regularly tuning in. Today, 
A small band of Belsat reporters are working inside the country out of a secret office to report on National Freedom Day. Although officially the day marks the formation of the Belarusian People's Republic, it is now used as an opportunity to demonstrate by those opposed to the rule of President Lukashenko. <laughs> Перше, першиню буде істи інтернет-трансляція прямая, якою буде займатися Баразенко. Буде друга група вести пряму трансляцію сполучення під час ефіру. Гета друга група буде Люба. Вони, як ви знаєте, не можна працювати без акредитації. Якщо у тебе немає акредитації, і во время розгону забирають демонстрантів, то журналіст відповідає як учасник акції. Кстати, ни одна акция 25-го на День Бури не, не проходила без экшена. Ни одна. Уверена. Уверена, потому что по идее, когда наши журналисты затремливают, наша часть нас теперь не хвалюсь. Это правда, да. Я... The presence of the KGB, Belarus's secret police, is not hard to spot. with our journalists by phone because we, we, we cannot use you know, this satellite connection because we, we don't have any permission. День волі усіх сподарства з самим головним і самим демократичним святом. У студії працює Сергій Пацасон. Доброго вечора і запрошую на головне новини дня. Білорусам, що це є свято і свято, яке мусить супроводжатися радістю, а не страхами і репресіями. Ми кожен хвост знімаємо цю акцію, бачимо, що кожен хвост сюди приходить все більше і більше молоді. А чому це відбувається? Не тому, що їм розповідають про це, у них є інтернет. Вийди на вулицю, верні собі город! Вийди на вулицю, верні собі город! Whilst the Belarus government still has a strong grip on the media output in the country, increasing amounts of independent media are finding ways to break through the blackout. Бачите, як шмат людей зібралося з білшими на білими стягами тут. Не все мы хотим одного – демократичной, европейской Беларуси. Наше поколение, мое поколение, моих детей. Но мы будем смагаться за это. All right, everyone, thanks for a great semester. The exam will take place tomorrow morning as scheduled. And I had a wonderful time with you and I know that you'll do very well. I will see you on the other side. Take it easy. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, have a good one.